from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. You're watching The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. This is MIT CDO IQ, the Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Conference. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Paul Gillen. Professor, Dr. Stuart Madnick is here, longtime CUBE alum, uh, longtime professor at MIT, soon to be retired, <laughs> uh, but we're really grateful that you're taking your time to come on the CUBE, it's great to see you again. Well, it's great to see you again. It's been a long time since we've worked together and I really appreciate the opportunity to share our experience here at MIT with your audience. Well, it's really been fun to watch this conference evolve. Uh, we're full and it's really amazing. We have to move to a new venue next year, <laughs> I understand. Um, and Data, we talk about the data explosion all the time, but one of the areas that you're focused on and you're going to talk about today is, is ethics and privacy. And data causes so many concerns in those two areas. But so, give us a highlight of what you're going to discuss with the audience today and we'll get into it. Well, one of the things that makes it so challenging is, is data has so many implications to it. And that's why the issue of ethics is so hard to get people to reach agreement on it. We were talking to people regarding medicine and the idea of big data and AI. So in order to be able to really identify uh, causes, you need mass amounts of data. But that means more data has to be made available. As long as it's everybody else's data, not mine. Well, not in my backyard, if you will. So you have this issue where, on the one hand, people are concerned about sharing the data. On the other hand, there's so many valuable things we gain by sharing data. And getting people to reach agreement is a challenge. Well, one of the things I wanted to explore with you is how things have changed. Now you you know, back in the day, very familiar with, and Paul, you as well, with, with Microsoft, the Department of Justice, FTC, issues regarding uh, Microsoft, and it wasn't so much around data, it was really around browsers and bundling things today. But today you see Facebook and Google, Amazon coming under fire, and it's largely data related. Uh, Liz, Liz Warren last night, again, break up big tech. Your thoughts on similarities and differences between sort of the, the monopolies of yesterday and the data monopolies of today. You know, should they be broken up? Um, what are your thoughts on well, that? Well, let me broaden the issue a little bit more, if okay. you will, and, and I don't know how the, the demographics of your audience, but I often refer to the characteristics of millennials. Uh, the millennials in general, I ask my students this question here, you know, how many of you have a Facebook account? And you know, almost everybody in the class sure. has a Facebook account. So you realize you've given away a lot of information about yourself. It, it, it doesn't really occur to them that that may be an issue. I was told by someone that in some countries, Facebook is very popular, that's how they coordinate kidnappings of uh, you know, teenagers from rich families. They uh, track them, they know they're going to go to this basketball game or the soccer match, they know exactly where they're going after it, that's a perfect spot to kidnap them. So I don't know whether the students think about the fact that when they're putting things on Facebook, they're making so much of their life at risk. On the other hand, it makes their life richer, more enjoyable, and so that's why these things are so challenging. Now, getting back to the issue of the breakup of the big tech companies, one of the big challenges there is that in order to do the great things that big data has been doing and the things that AI promises to do, you need lots of data. Having organizations that can gather it all together in a, in a relatively systematic and consistent manner is so valuable. Breaking up the tech companies, and there are some reasons why people want to do that, but also interferes with that benefit. And that's why I think it's got to be looked at real carefully is to see not only what gain may be made by breaking up, but also what losses or disadvantages we're creating for ourselves. So an example might be, perhaps it, it makes the uh, United States less competitive vis-a-vis -vis China in the area of machine intelligence is, is one example. The flip side of that is, you know, Facebook has every incentive to appropriate our data to sell ads. Yeah. And so it's not an easy you know, equation. Yeah. Well, it, you know, even ads are a funny situation. For some people, having a product call to your attention that's something actually you really want, but you never knew it before, could be viewed as a feature. Right. So you know, in some cases, the ads could be viewed as a feature by some people, and of course, uh, a, a bit of intrusion by other people. Well, sometimes we used to search Google, right, yeah. Paul? Looking for the ad on the side. Right. No longer, it's, it's all ads. Well, well, you I, see, go look. ahead. Well, I wonder if you see public, uh, public sen uh, sentiment changing in this respect. There's a lot of concern, certainly at the legislative level now, about misuse of data. But Facebook 
usership is not going down, Instagram membership is not going down, uh, it, the indication is that, that ordinary citizens don't really care. I, I, that, that's been my, I don't, I don't have all the data maybe you may have seen, but just anecdotally and talking to people and the work we're doing, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think most people, I, I, it may be a bit dramatic, but I was at a conference once and someone made a comment that there has not been the digital Pearl Harbor yet. No, there's not been some event that was just so onerous and so awe-inspiring that people remember the day it happened kind of thing. And so these things happen and there may be a little bit of press coverage and you're back on your Facebook account or Instagram account the next day. There's nothing is really dramatic. I mean, individuals may change now and then, but I don't see massive changes. But you had the Equifax hack two years ago, 145 million records. Capital One just this week, 100 million records. I mean, that seems pretty Pearl Harbor-ish to me. Well, it's funny. Uh, we were talking about that earlier today regarding different parts of the world. I think in Europe in general, they, they really seem to care about privacy. The United States, they kind of care about privacy. In China, they know they have no privacy. But even in the US where they care about privacy, exactly how much they care about it is really an issue. And in general, it's not enough to move the needle. It, if it does, it moves it a little bit. Hey, how about the time when they showed that uh, smart TVs can be broken into? Smart TV sales did not dodge an inch. Not much how many people even remember that big scandal a year ago. Well, now, but to your point about Equifax, I mean, you know, just this week, I think, Equifax came out with a, a website yeah, right. where you could check whether or not your credentials were... It's were, a new product. Were, were, <laughs> right, were, were compromised. And, and if they and were... Had been. As had mine, as had my wife's, as <laughs> Stu. Yep. So you had a choice, you know, free monitoring or $125. So, I mean, <laughs> but, and then we went, okay, now what? You know, life goes on. You know, it so it do doesn't you, seem yeah. like anything really changes. And we were talking earlier about your 1972 book about cybersecurity, yeah. that many of the principles that you outlined in that book are still valid yeah. today. Now, why are we not making more progress against cyber criminals? Well, what, two things. One thing is you got to realize, as I said before, the caveman had no privacy problems and no break-in problems. But I'm not sure we, any of us want to go back to the caveman era because you've got to realize that for all these bad things, there's so many good things that are happening. Things you can now do with your smartphone you couldn't even visualize doing a decade or two ago. Mm -hmm. So there's so much excitement, so much forward momentum, you know, autonomous cars and so on and so on, that these minor bumps in the road are easy to ignore in the enthusiasm and excitement. Well, and, and now as we head into 2020, the election, you know, it was, it was fake news yeah. in, in 2016. Now we got, we've got deep fakes, yeah. and we've got the ability to really use video in, in new ways. Um, do you see a way out of that problem? I mean, a lot of people looking at blockchain. You wrote an article recently yeah. in blockchain. You know, you think it's unhackable. Well, think again. Um, what are you seeing? In well, the I, I think the, the, one of the things we always talk about when we talk about improving privacy and security in organizations the first thing is awareness. Most people are only in a you know, small moment of time aware that there's an issue, and it quickly passes in their mind. Uh, the analogy I use regarding industrial safety, you go into almost any factory, you'll see a sign over the door every day that says, 520 days is last industrial accident, and then a subline, please do not be the one to reset it to zero. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I often say, when's the last time you went to a data center and so our sign is at 50 milliseconds is last cyber attack <laughs> or data breach and so on. And so it needs to be something that is really front of mind in people. And we talk about how to make awareness activities both in companies and in host households. And that's one of our major movements here is to try to make people more aware. Because if you're not aware that you're putting things at risk, you're not going to do anything about it. Last year, uh, we contacted at SiliconANGLE 22 leading security experts and yep. asked them a simple question. Are we winning or losing the war against cyber criminals? Unanimously, they said we're losing. What is your opinion of that question? I have a great quote I like to use. The good news is the good guys are getting better. Better firewalls, better cryptographic codes, but the bad guys are getting badder faster. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I won't dwell on all of them, uh, but we came out with an article talking about the dark web. And the reason why it's fascinating is if you go to most companies, if they've suffered a data breach or a, a cyber attack, they'll be very reluctant to say much about it unless they're really compelled to do so. On the dark web, they love to rant and reputation. I'm the one who broke into Capital One. And so there's much more information sharing. 
they're much more organized, they're much more disciplined. I mean, the, the, the criminal ecosystem is so much more superior than the chaotic mess we have here on the good guys side of the table. Do you see any hope for that? There are services, IBM has one and there are others that are sort of anonymized uh, 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 security data, enable organizations to share uh, uh, sensitive information without risk to their, their company. Do you see any uh, hope on the collaboration front? Well, as I said before, the good guys are getting better. The trouble is, at first I thought there was an issue there wasn't enough sharing going on. It turns out we identified over 120 sharing organizations. That's the good news and the bad news. There's 120, so IBM is one and there's another 119 more to go. So mm -hmm. the, it's not a very well coordinated sharing that's going on. It's just one example of the challenges. Do I see any hope in the future? Well, in the more distant future because the, the challenge we have is that there'll be a cyber attack next week of some form or shape that we've never seen before. And therefore we're probably not well prepared for it. At some point I'll no longer be able to say that. But I think the, the cyber attackers and, and breachers and so on are so creative they've got another decade or more to go before they run out of steam. Well, we've gone from hacktivists to organized crime, now nation states, and you start thinking about the future of war. I was talking to Robert Gates about this, the, uh, the former defense secretary, and my, my question was sort of, well, don't we have the best cyber? Can't we go in the offense? He goes, yeah, but we also have the most to lose. <laughs> our critical infrastructure and the value of that to our society is much greater than some of our adversaries. Yeah. So we have to be very careful. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling to think. Autonomous vehicles is another one. Yeah. I know that you have some visibility on that. Uh, uh, and, and you were saying that the technical challenges, if, help me if I get this right, yeah. of actually achieving quality autonomous vehicles are so daunting that security is getting pushed to the back burner. And if, uh, the irony is I had a conversation, I was a visiting professor at the University of Nice about uh, 12, 14 years ago, and that's before autonomous vehicles were on the eye, but they were doing, doing what they call automotive telemetrics. And I realized at that time that, that security wasn't really a top priority. I happened to visit an organization doing real autonomous vehicles now, 14 years later, and this conversation was almost identical. Now, the problems they're trying to solve are harder problems they had 14 years ago, mm. much more challenging problems, and as a result, those problems dominate their mindset. And security issues kind of, you know, we'll get around to, if, if we can't get the car to ride correctly, why worry about security? Well, uh, what about the ethics of autonomous vehicles? Yeah. <laughs> we talked <laughs> about that, yeah. You're, you're programming, you know, if you're going to hit a baby or a, a, a woman or kill your passengers or yourself, what do you tell the machine to do? Uh, uh, that is, it seems like an unsolvable problem. Well, I'm an engineer by training and possibly many people in the mm -hmm. audience are too. I'm the kind of person who likes nice, clear, clean answers. Two plus two is four, mm -hmm. not 3.9, not 4.1. That's the school up the street may deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> The trouble with, with ethic issues is they don't tend to have a nice clean answer. Almost every study we've done that has these kind of issues on it, and we have people vote, almost always it's spread across the board. Because you, you know any one of these is a bad decision. So which the bad decision is least bad? Like what's an example that you use in your class? Well the classes? example I use in my class, and, and we've been using it now for about well over a year now, in a class I teach on ethics, is you are the designer of an autonomous vehicle, so you must program it to do everything. Okay. And the particular case you have is you're in the vehicle, it's driving around the mountain in Swiss Alps. You go around a corner and the vehicle, using all its sensors, realize that straight ahead on the right-hand lane is a woman in a baby carriage pushing onto this. Onto the left, just entering the crossway, are three gentlemen. Both sides of the road have concrete barriers. So you can stay on your path, hit the woman in the baby carriage, veer to the left, hit the three men, take a sharp right or a sharp left, hit the, the concrete wall and kill yourself. And the trouble is, every one of those is unappealing. You know, imagine the headline, kills woman and baby. That's not a very good thing. There actually is a theory of ethics called utility theory. that says better to save three people than two or one. So therefore, you do not kill, want to kill three men. That's, that's the worst. And then the idea of hitting the, the concrete wall may feel magnanimous, well, I'm just killing myself. But then, as a designer of the car, shouldn't your number one duty be to protect the owner of the car? Yeah, yeah. And so what people basically do, they close their eyes and flip a coin because they don't want any one of those it's answers. It's not an algorithmic response. It doesn't lead, 
I, I want to come back before we, before we close here uh, to the subject of this conference. Exactly. Data. You've been involved with this conference since the very beginning. Uh, how have you seen the conversation change since that time? Well, I think, I think it's changed in two ways. First, as you know, this is a record-breaking group of people we're expecting here, close to 500, I think, have registered. Uh, so it's clearly grown kind of you know, over the years. But also, the, the extent to which, whether it was called big data or called AI now, whatever, is something that was kind of not quite on the radar when we started, I think it was over 15 years ago, we first started the conference series. So clearly it's become something that is not just something we talk about in the academic world, but is becoming mainstay business for corporations more and more. And I think it's just going to keep increasing. I think so much of our society, so much of business, is so dependent on the data in any way, shape, or form that we use it and have it. Well, it's, and it's come full circle, as Paul and I were talking at our open, this conference kind of emerged from the ashes of the back office, yep. information quality, and then, like you say, the big data and now AI. And guess what? It's all coming back to information quality. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Lots of data that's no good, is <laughs> or that you don't understand what to do with is not very helpful. Yeah. Well, Dr. Matic, thank you so much oh, for coming. It's a pleasure. I really love being here for all these years. Really want to thank you for and that. And I want to thank you guys for joining us and helping to spread the word. Yeah, thank it's been you. Our pleasure. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Paul and I will be back at MIT CBO IQ right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE.